After the initial reservation by two GOP leaders, several key Senate Republicans have declared their support for President Trump's vote to fill the vacant Supreme Court seat. The Senate is back in session with leaders from both parties slamming each other over their response to Ginsburg's death. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention goes back to previous guidance about how the coronavirus is transmitted and ditches the theory about airborne transmission posted on its website earlier. As the United States crosses the devastating threshold of 200,000 lives lost to COVID-19, the COVID Memorial Project installs 20,000 American flags on the National Mall. The flags will be displayed on the grounds of the Washington Monument facing the White House. Tropical storm Beta makes landfall in Texas, brings pounding rain and flash floods to Houston. Authorities issue a flash flood watch for Victoria and New Orleans. Beta becomes the ninth named storm to hit the continental US this year. Louisville police declare a state of emergency as the city braces for a grand jury decision on Brianna Taylor, an emergency medical technician who died in a police raid at her apartment this year. Attorney General Daniel Cameron is expected to make a public announcement of his findings. As the countdown for the historic election day begins, presidential candidates are back on the campaign trail. U.S. President Donald Trump took his re-election bid to the key swing state of Ohio. Polls indicate that the president enjoys a slight lead over his Democratic contender, Joe Biden. So what were the issues covered by the president in Ohio? And was the state of Ohio aware of pandemic restrictions? Let's find out. U.S. President Donald Trump arrived in Ohio for two election rallies. He expressed enthusiasm on Twitter and said, I was thrilled to be back in Ohio tonight with thousands of loyal, hard-working American patriots. 43 days from now, we are going to win Ohio and we are going to win four more years in the White House. Supporters were cheering and waving as Trump stepped out of Air Force One. Trump's address in Ohio focused on two broad issues, economy and vacant Supreme Court seat. Trump gave himself credit for boosting manufacturing and bracing the state for the COVID-19 pandemic. He warned the people of Ohio of economic devastation if Biden won the state. He also promised that the economy will bounce back once the pandemic fades. My plan is to crush the virus. Biden plan and Biden's really plan is to and it's not it's not that he wants to crush America, but he will just out of gross incompetence. Biden will surrender to the virus just like he surrendered to China and just like he surrendered to the radical left, including his own running mate who's running the show. And she's nothing special. Trump has been holding political events for weeks now. This despite repeated warnings by government officials about the dangers of large crowds amid the pandemic. Ohio rallies were no different. People stood close to each other as they cheered for Trump. Many people were spotted without a mask. Ohio has reported more than 145,000 COVID-19 cases. More than 4,000 people have lost their lives. Poll predictions suggest that Trump is slightly ahead of Biden in Ohio. 
In 2016 election, Trump beat Hillary Clinton in Ohio by an 8% lead. Despite the lead, many strategists claim that Trump is losing support in suburban areas of the state. U.S. Election Desk, we on World is One. Meanwhile, former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden has taken his re-election bid to the battleground state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin had voted Democrat for the past 20 years. However, in 2016, they voted for Trump. So will Joe Biden be able to win back Wisconsin? And what's the political climate there right now? Let's find out. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden arrived in Wisconsin to make his election pitch. Speaking at a campaign event, Biden steered clear of the latest election agenda, the vacant Supreme Court seat. Instead, he used the opportunity to highlight Trump's mishandling of the coronavirus pandemic. Before the vacant Supreme Court seat became a focal point, election campaigns were dominated by racial unrest, coronavirus outbreak, unemployment and economy. Biden went back to the overshadowed issues and called out the Trump administration for mismanagement. Taking a dig at Trump's house full rallies, Biden said that Trump could have saved lives but continued to hold political events without following social distancing norms. When Donald Trump said he didn't create a, he didn't want to create a panic, he wasn't just talking about a health panic. He was focused on the stock market. Trump was worried that if he told the public the truth, there would be a panic on the financial markets, and that would hurt his chances of being re-elected. The COVID-19 death toll in the United States is rising. It will soon cross the 200,000 mark, the highest any country has recorded. The actual death toll is said to be much higher. The United States has less than 5% of the world's population and more than 20% of the reported COVID-19 deaths. Biden blames Trump for all the loss. Trump panicked. The virus was too big for him. All his life, Donald Trump has been bailed out of any problem he faced. And with this crisis, a real crisis, the crisis that required serious presidential leadership, he just wasn't up to it. He froze. He failed to act. He panicked. And America's paid the worst price of any nation in the world. Trump's 2016 victory in Wisconsin came as a shock for many. No Republican had won the state for decades. However, this year, poll prediction suggests that Biden is leading in Wisconsin. The United States of America. U.S. Election Desk, one we on. World is one. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. With Election Day inching closer, U.S. presidential nominees have shifted focus to swing states. But what are swing states and why are they so important in the 2020 U.S. presidential elections? Our next report has all the answers. We want to tell you what kind of president our dad will be. We are making America strong again. On November the 3rd, Donald Trump and Joe Biden will be watching a few states, more closely than others. These are the swing states, also known as the purple or the battleground states. The states where the race is expected to be the closest, where the winner remains unclear till the final votes are counted. The presidential candidates often spend more time and money in these states than other states. So how are the swing states determined? The swing states are predicted at the beginning of the election cycle based on the political history or ongoing activity and also on the number of electoral votes. This is where the concept of electoral college comes into play. So what is an electoral college? Remember the 2016 elections? Donald Trump became the president despite getting almost 3 million fewer votes than Hillary Clinton. It all comes down to how the American president is elected. When Americans go to polls in November, they won't technically be voting for Donald Trump or Joe Biden the American citizens will be voting for the members of something called the Electoral College. Each state has a number of members, also known as the electors, based on the population. 
This year, there are 538 electors and the winning presidential candidate will need to get a majority of at least 270 votes. In most states, the candidate which wins the popular votes gets the support of all the electors of that state. So if a candidate wins a state with the highest number of electors, even if the win is a razor-thin one, he will receive all of the electoral votes of that state. Therefore, it is possible for a candidate to lose the popular vote across the country and still win the presidency. Experts have identified eight states as the key battleground states in 2020 on the basis of electoral college and the ongoing political crises. Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. The other politically active states which might also emerge as battleground states are Ohio and Virginia. Most of these states have historically been unpredictable, swinging from one party to another. These are the reasons why the candidates focus on the battleground states rather than a nationwide campaign. In 2016, two-thirds of the campaign events were held in just six states. So every election year, these battleground states play a crucial role in electing a president. U.S. Election Desk, we on, World is One. U.S. presidential elections are still more than a month away. However, early polling has begun in seven U.S. states in the form of mail-in ballots or absentee voting, the latest being the state of Missouri, which has started voting in some of its counties. The other six states include New Jersey, Minnesota, Vermont, Wyoming, South Dakota, and Virginia. Here's a report on America's polling process and the controversy surrounding it. Early voting, also called advanced polling or pre-poll voting, is a convenient voting process which allows people to cast their vote prior to the scheduled election day. For the United States, early voting is similar to no excuse absentee voting. The pre-polling period varies for different states. The process of early voting was introduced for Americans living outside of the United States and the members of the military and merchant marine and their families. The American citizens have the options to vote by ballot, mail, fax, email and even on web portals. But almost since the beginning of the 2020 elections and the arrival of pandemic, mail-in voting has suddenly become a controversial issue. People have been voting by mail in the U.S. for close to 100 years, but it has never been as big an issue as it is in the 2020 election. And there are two reasons for that. The number of voters who vote early has increased in recent years, and with the pandemic casting a shadow over the presidential polls, the Democrats have pushed for citizens to vote by mail. In the 2016 presidential election, approximately 33 million votes were cast via mailed out ballots, which makes for about a quarter of all ballots cast across the country. And this year, there has been a tenfold increase in the request for mail ballots even in states that don't usually use mail-in voting. The second reason for the ballot voting becoming an issue is President Donald Trump. Trump has repeatedly been claiming that the widespread mail-in voting will inevitably lead to fraud. They're sending out tens of millions of ballots to everybody, people that didn't expect them. People are getting inundated with ballots. They'll be showered with ballots. Everybody in this room knows it's a scam, okay? Everybody in this room, even John. Don't say it, John, because What's it's a scam. A scam. What? Sending ballots, sending ballots at a level they are never going to be able to count them. There is again very little evidence for that, and despite Trump's unsubstantiated claims, the number of states pushing for mail-in voting is only rising. 
Even battleground state of Nevada, a federal judge has dismissed a lawsuit brought by the Trump campaign over the state's new mail-in voting law. The president's team has 30 days to appeal the verdict, but a change in result looks unlikely. U.S. Election Desk, we on World is One. The vacant Supreme Court seat has become a new election agenda. U.S. President Donald Trump is set to announce his nominees as early as Friday. This right criticism from the opposition and some in his own party, he's made clear that he will go ahead with the decision before the November 5th elections. He's narrowed his choices from 40 to 3. So who are the front runners and when will she replace Ginsburg's seat? Here's more. President Donald Trump has got a unique opportunity to leave a long-lasting impact on the U.S. judiciary. This as he plans to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a liberal stalwart, with a conservative. The president appears to have secured enough support in the U.S. Senate to win approval for his nominee. I would say on Friday or Saturday I'll be announcing the pick. Uh, it's uh, five women are being looked at and vetted very carefully, five, and uh, we'll make a decision probably Saturday, but Friday or Saturday. The choices have been narrowed down from 40 to five. And according to reports, the three top conservative contenders for the coveted job are Amy Coney Barrett, Barbara Lagoa, and Joan Larson. No concern, I just think it would be better. They asked would I rather have it. I'd rather have it before the election. I think it would be better for our country. And we uh, will pick somebody that's outstanding, very qualified. They're all qualified, but uh, somebody that it's outstanding. And I'd rather see it all take place uh, before the election, so before November 3rd. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell did a 180 on the issue of filling the vacant seats in an election year. He has prioritized the confirmation of Trump's judicial appointment. McConnell vows to make sure that the Senate will vote on the Supreme Court nomination this year. If our Democratic colleagues want to claim they are outraged, they can only be outraged at the plain facts of American history. There was clear precedent behind the predictable outcome that came out of 2016. And there's even more overwhelming precedent behind the fact that this Senate will vote on this nomination this year. The American people re-elected our majority in 2016. The issue of a vacant Supreme Court seat has been highly politicized. The battle is on to find a justice who will succeed Ruth Bader Ginsburg, an icon and an inspiration to millions of Americans. Keeping tradition in mind, her chair on the Supreme Court bench has been draped with black wool crepe. Late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg will lie in repose at the U.S. Supreme Court for public viewing this week. Hundreds of people are expected to gather outside the Supreme Court to pay their final respects, as America continues to mourn the loss of an icon. U.S. Election Desk, we on World is One. For a public view outside the iconic steps of the U.S. Supreme Court for two days, after that, Ruth Bader Ginsburg will be laid to rest in a private ceremony at the Arlington National Cemetery. As politicians brace for a monumental battle, here's a report on her journey to the highest seat at the Supreme Court.
The next key date on the campaign trail is September 29th, the first U.S. presidential debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Here's more on the story. This election will decide whether we save the American dream or whether we allow a socialist agenda to demolish our cherished destiny. Now that the conventions have ended with Republican President Donald Trump and his Democratic Party rival, former Vice President Joe Biden, making their opening okay. arguments. This is a life changing election. This will determine what America is going to look like for a long, long time. Both candidates have gotten onto the campaign trail, honing their messages to voters in key states ahead of their first face to face debate on September 29th. I think that we can expect to see a rowdy debate um, between the two presidential candidates. Jennifer Murchia is a communications professor at Texas A&M University. She says both Biden and Trump are fighters. And he isn't shy to do that, to mock people or to bully them during a debate. He did that in 2016. Um, and with Joe Biden, uh, what we've seen from him, you know, he's, he sort of has a longer history of doing debates in politics. And what we've seen from him is that he's very willing to stand his ground. Um, we saw in 2012 that uh, his vice presidential debate was uh, similarly, you know, I think it, to Trump in style in that he sort of mocked his opposition a little bit. Presidential debates have largely kept to a format of the candidates answering questions from a moderator. It is actually informative to see both candidates um, in contrast to one another. So to hear how they speak, you know, the tone they use, but also to hear about their policies. It allows them to directly accuse one another of doing things, and it also allows them to make rebuttals so that they can defend themselves. John Koch is the debate director at Vanderbilt University. He says there needs to be an evolution beyond what he calls press conference sound bites. The debate would start with, here's the issue or the situation. You have 30 minutes or whatever it is to meet with your consultants and advisors, and then we want you to come back with a position, explain your position, and then we'll have a debate about how you arrived at that decision. And then the, you know, the quality of those decisions. Whether viewership this year tops the estimated 84 million Americans who watched the first debate in 2016, it is questionable how many voters it will sway. A lot of the research on presidential debates have shown that it kind of lets people identify with the candidate that they kind of already identify with. It just kind of lets them see who shares their positions. Right. There's not a lot of evidence, per se, that it changes, presidential debates change minds. I really think that, you know, for these debates to have any kind of effect um, like they should, the, the audience itself has a responsibility to listen with an open mind. According to Pew Research, 10 percent of 2016 voters said they decided their vote during or just after the debates. Steve Reddish, VOA News, Washington. Thank you for watching today's edition of U.S. Election Special Broadcast. We'll be here tomorrow, same time, same place. See you then. Thank you.